from the author of Spinsterella, the strange and unusual romance in Spellbound, that darker shade of black gum, the legendary Mad Matilda. Pick up the conclusion of the Spinsterella trilogy in paperback and key readers this Halloween. In today's video, I'm going to be reading a sample chapter from my 2011 novel, The Temptation of John Haynes. And The Temptation of John Haynes is about a man who has been tempted by Easteen, a she-demon who has been sent to try to make him make a compromise that could cost him his soul. I hope you enjoy this sample chapter, and I hope you pick up the book on Amazon.com or other online booksellers. I stare at my reflection in the scratched plastic window of the crowded D-trains that bolts into the 7th Avenue station. I should have followed Colleen's advice and called in sick today, said something cute to the receptionist like I had a broken heart or something. But if I stayed home, I don't think I'd ever get out of bed again. Even though I'm hurting, I don't want to act like a guy who just got dumped, living in the gentrified ghetto of Harlem with a mortgage and bills to pay. I can't afford to turn into that dirty, unshaven brother because my woman left me. By the end of the month, the bank would be foreclosing on my condo, and realtors would be posting ads for it. Besides, work will take my mind off Colleen. I think about what she told me this morning watching the silver E-train race in the station in the opposite direction. I guess over the last fast five years, we were going in different directions, changing into different people. The polished businesswoman I know today is nothing like the frumpy goth I wanted to marry. I crack a smile thinking about happier times as the subway doors close. A forced grin eases tension inside me as the train falls into the Rockefeller Center station. I get off the train, march up the stairs and through the turnstile. On my way to the 50th Street exit, I rush through the mezzanine of underground shops outside the subway station. I stop off for a donut myself, but I just want to be alone in my office for a couple of minutes. My watch reads 8.45. I'll be able to have that moment alone if I move quickly. I hurry up the stairs and turn the corner of 50th Street to enter the Rockefeller Center office tower. I twirl through the polished glass revolving door and dart through the lobby over to the elevator bank servicing floors 2 through 18. When the elevator opens on the 10th floor, I find my assistant, Carlin, standing in front of the reception desk, shaking nervously. I wonder what has rattled so badly. What's going on, Carla? Somebody do something to you? Carla's eyes fall to the floor. Eric wants you to go directly to his office. Carla somberly shuffles back to her desk. I'll talk to her about what's bothering her when I get out of this meeting. I turn left and walk down a long, berber-carpeted corridor, then turn the corner. At the end of the hall is a tall, ash-colored wooden door with the name Eric Tuttleson, Vice President, inscribed on a brass plaque. I open the door, and the short, wavy-haired, mocha-colored man in the bird's-eye business suit turns away from the picture window he's staring out of to greet me with a scowl. I smile at him, hoping to break the tension swirling around the room. You wanted to see me? Yes, I did, John. Have a seat. Hearing the twangy nasal sound of his voice makes me uneasy. He's knocked it up a few octaves to make himself sound white. Eric peers down contemptuously at me as I ease into the smooth black leather office chair in front of his glass top desk. When my brown eyes lock into his green contacts, I hear the anger in his voice. John, I'm going to be frank with you. I never really liked your work. So he's not a fan of my work. He should be a fan of results. I have a long track record of successful product launches. I'll stand behind everything I've done here. I don't understand why you're displeased. Since I've become director of marketing a year ago, the public has a better awareness of our products than in the history of the company. Your thang is not what I want representing this company, Eric mocks. Now, you're an excellent worker, but your vision for Sunrise is not in tandem with mine. I need people on my team who can see things the way I do. I see us making a lot more money than we did five years ago. Productivity isn't the issue here, John. In order for an individual to grow in a corporate culture, they must have values similar to those of the group. After reviewing your resume and background, it's clear to me that you're not going to fit in with the members of the overall Sunrise senior management team. Listening to his arrogant comments, it seems who I am rubs him the wrong way, since I'm just a common Negro to him and not one of those blacks with a high-class pedigree. I'm not supposed to be working in this kind of job. In his Sunrise Foods, senior management jobs are only for those blacks who have the honor of tracing their bloodline back to their white slave masters. My bad for working hard and getting promoted on the merits. My resume and background were quite impressive when I was hired here five years ago. For someone working in an entry-level position, Eric dismisses. However, Sunrise Foods needs a creative visionary with a more refined background to supervise our marketing department. My ideal candidate would be someone whose experiences have enabled them to gain an expanded perspective of the world. An individual with a degree from a top university who worked an internship at a major corporation. This more well-rounded individual would be more suited to the tasks of running our department than someone of your limited experiences. 
By using big words and jargon, he thinks I won't know he's just insulted me. Normally, I wouldn't say anything and just walk out of the room, but this Tom has pissed me off in his pitiful attempt to patronize me. I'll show him how smart I really am. I get up out of my seat and put on a friendly smile. Basically, I have too much bass in my voice. I don't know what you're insinuating, Eric says, backing away. I'm not insinuating anything. You said I was too ghetto to be a manager here. I never said that. You implied it. Eric gets nervous. Called on his game, the worm shows his true colors. In my professional opinion, it was a mistake for the lower level managers to promote a person with your background and into this junior executive position. Now I've had a substantial severance package directly deposited into your account. What, you're firing me? I just don't see a place for you here at Sunrise Foods, John. I just can't send you back to market research. No, you can't have me telling the masses about your paper bag test. I don't know what you're insinuating, John. Your employment here is at will. I can terminate you at any time for any reason. He figures the craven elitist would use company policy to cover his actions. The coward probably researched this down to the last letter of human resource law so he could have every legal justification for firing me. It seems this old, proud, black-owned company isn't as pro-black or as self-aware as it purports itself to be. I guess I have two weeks' notice. Actually, I'd like you out of the building as soon as possible. I'm sorry you wasted so much time here in your professional career with us. Eric hits a button on his intercom. The door opens abruptly, and two burly security guards storm the room. I guess they're here to restrain me in the case I decide to get found, like all those thugs he sees in the gangster rap videos. The only person embarrassing himself will be Eric Tuttleson. I'm not giving him the satisfaction. I'm sorry I wasted my time with you two. Guys, could you please escort Mr. Haynes out of the building? Thanks a lot. Oh, I'm John in private and Mr. Haynes in front of company. He's lucky I'm a Christian or I'd curse him out. Carla nervously shuffles into the office with a white cardboard box containing my belongings. I can tell by the disgusted look on her face she didn't want any part of this. I'm sorry, John. Don't be. As I take the box from her, the chocolate-colored brother to the left of me gestures for a canister on his belt. Brother, you don't have to reach for the prepper spray. It ain't going down like that. The guard pulls his hand away from the canister, and I am escorted down the corridor to the elevator bank. My heart pounds in my chest as I check the contents of my box. Joe Fixit Hulk action figure, Egyptian Queen's calendar, post-it notes, Vanessa Williams CD, Luther Vandrell CD, Whitney Houston CD, broken Batman mug I use as a pencil cup, Hudson College coffee mug, my winter gloves, stapler, legal pads, Rolodex, framed photos of Colleen and me, 10 framed achievement awards that hung in my office. Carla did a good job of packing all my personal effects. Everything is all here. One of the guards hits the down button and the officers follow me into the car. I take deep breaths to calm myself until the elevator opens in the lobby. It's not until I twirl through the brass revolving door and walk out onto the sidewalk that they turn around and head back to their posts. I keep my eyes down on the contents of my box as I turn the corner. I need to get down to Tiffany's to get my money back from Colleen's engagement ring. I'm sorry. Thankfully, the tall, red-suited stranger doesn't appear upset by my violation of his personal space. I'm about to apologize, but the warm smile of the burly black man's face tells me there's no love lost. I'm sorry. That's all right, brother. You have a good day. Thanks, man. When the stranger turns around and walks down 6th Avenue, I continue walking up towards 5th Avenue. The faster I get this refund, the faster I can get started on my job hunt. If you want to finish the story, you can pick up The Temptation of John Haynes on Amazon.com and other online booksellers in paperback and e-readers.